I'm 71 years old, and I may bring a slightly new perspective to your discussion about police accountability. Please, Please do. Well, um, I, I live in Madison, Wisconsin, but I also have a summer home in Prince Edward Island, Canada. A year ago in Canada, in a minor parking incident where I backed into a vehicle, maybe, um, I couldn't see the scratch, I couldn't feel the impact, but I was told I had backed into a vehicle. A RCMP, that's what they call them up there, the federal officers, Royal the Canadian Police, Mounted Police yep. assaulted me. Oh, my. Um, in, a, in a minor parking incident. Um, this was... Um, How old were you at the time, Margo? I was 70. Okay. All right, I'm, Margo, I want to hear the rest of your story. Stand by. We will continue, and you can join us here. As we continue with your calls and thoughts, we've got Margo, who was just beginning to tell us about an incident in Prince Edward Island, Canada. Uh, back, You were 70 years old at the time of the incident. There was a parking uh, snafu that a police officer you said assaulted you, and that was kind of where we left your story. So please continue. Right. And what it, what it demonstrated to me is that we hear a lot about how black lives matter, and they do matter. And I know that young black men are particularly targeted, and I don't want to minimize what it means to be in the minority community. But I think we need to face that the majority community, um, white middle class people, including elderly people, are also subject to excessive police force. Absolutely. And when I came back to the United States and talked about what happened to me, and I was a little a little concerned that people would think, what kind of an old lady are you, that somebody grabbed you and sprained your arm and terrified you. Um, I was afraid people would think there was something wrong with me, but what I found was that everybody I told my story to, almost without exception, had a story to tell back. Mm -hmm. Kind of like your earlier caller said, that um, most black people can tell you about their unfortunate interactions with the police. I found that white middle-class people were saying to me, wait till I tell you what happened to my brother. This is what I was telling you earlier, criminal. Mark, when you were saying that uh, the police mm -hmm. need to enforce things more consistently to create more victims so people can open up their eyes. More and more people are being enforced upon right. for ridiculous nonsense. That's happening. But we're acting as though this is a racial issue, and it isn't just a racial issue. No, it's it not. Is, it's a power it's issue. In part. It's only in part a racial issue. Um, I want to... Um, refer to the daughter of Eric Garner, the man in Staten Island who said, I cannot breathe over and over again while he was killed by the police sitting on him for, because he was selling cigarettes without a license. Didn't, it didn't uh, deserve to take his life. Killed for tax evasion. In any case, remember that his daughter was interviewed by CNN and they asked, um, is this a race issue, do you think? And she said it's a power issue. Yep. And she was everlasting credit. Absolutely right. How did they assault yeah. you? Can you tell us just a little bit more about your case? Well, my case was an interesting one in that the officer that did this to me, an RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, was a federal officer. Mm -hmm. um, we have no equivalent of this in the United States. Our federal officers are not empowered to act in municipal matters without consulting the municipal authorities. But this man did, and he claimed, and I guess with, with correctness, that um, a officer from any province in Canada, and he was from the other side, the Pacific side, he was from British Columbia, he was a security guard in plain clothes, hmm. off-duty, having lunch, watching me parallel park. He formed an opinion that I had backed into this vehicle, I felt no impact. I saw no damage. I suspected it was a scam. It might not have been, but I could not see any damage. He decided to intervene between me and the fellow who owned the vehicle. We were having an amicable conversation. I just simply didn't agree that there was damage. Mm -hmm. um, nobody asked for my papers. I didn't volunteer them. Um, it isn't the custom in America to do so. In Canada, I think it's a different culture, a far more, what shall I say, authority-conscious culture. Um, they tell me they offer their papers immediately. Um, I was told by the police what in Madison, Wisconsin, like that I did insurance. nothing wrong. Okay. But because I didn't offer my papers immediately, because I had doubts, I, I didn't leave the scene, but I just stood my ground because I was, in the eyes of this officer, stubborn. I guess. 
he decided that he was going to grab me, and he didn't ID himself as an officer. Oh, that's I had to ask crazy. him who he was, and then he identified that he was a federal officer from British Columbia. He was a security guard to the premier of British Columbia who was on the island for a conference. And I said, why would you intervene in a parking incident when you're from British Columbia and this is Prince Edward Island? <laughs> That's baffling. And, yeah, he, he explained to me that in Canada, a federal officer, unlike um, our federal officers, can intervene in any province on any issue, even jaywalking if they wish. <laughs> and I, as an American, um, I think that we are a different culture. Again, I said to him, why would you want to be bothered? Why would you do this? Why don't you call the municipal authorities if you think that I'm behaving incorrectly? And he said, you're under arrest, and wow. he grabbed me, and you'll go to jail. When the municipal police for what? arrived, they, under the arrest for what? Police re they refused to write up a report. They said if there was any damage, it was under $500. They wouldn't take me to jail. But he had already sprained my arm and sent me into shock. The only reason that he did not break my arm was that a passerby with a cell phone took a photograph. That makes a huge doing difference, doesn't yeah. it? That would look good God, for a plainclothes guy God, to be grabbing an old woman. For these good Samaritans who take out their cameras, yep. their cell phones. And, and that's document. what CopLock is all about. Thank you, Margo, for your yep. call and sharing your story tonight. And, you know, you don't know. You never know uh, who the police are going to mess with. I mean, I, I think she was right about that. They're picking on an old lady here. She's seventy years old and grabbing her and assaulting her in an, in an unnecessary manner. I mean, she sounds. Yeah, obviously, we don't know what it was like on the scene, but come on, really? Do you have to grab the old lady like that? Do you have to arrest somebody for? You know, a, a traffic snafu. I don't think you need to put cuffs on. If you, like, if he wants to arrest her, then it's time to go to the, you know, time to go to the car. I'm um, gonna for the arrest or whatever. I mean, I don't even understand what the reason for the arrest is. At that circumstance. You never know what's gonna happen when you pull a video camera out and record a scene with the police. But in my opinion, it's generally a good idea. It's generally something that helps protect people rather than putting them in further danger. Yes, you could end up being targeted by the police for doing that. But as she said, thank God for the people who are willing to do it.